Many of you may recognize Hideous Pajama as a suspected assassin of former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, a man whose artistic sensibilities can only be understood by Italian and French people, most definitely not any of those dense, first-person shooter-loving Americans. What? Why does that sound familiar? Now, you know, the, the, the critics are... I don't know what's going on with me and the critics of the United States, I gotta tell They've you. They've never got me, and it's getting worse. They're like, it's almost like, you know, I always had a European sensibility to my movie, so they... You might also recognize him as the creator of Strand-type games and how my autocorrect thinks Hideo Kojima is spelled. He's a man of many titles, but his crowning achievement by far, as far as most of the world is concerned, is the Metal Gear franchise. And while the series is actually older than I am, it's earned its place as one of the most iconic Hideo game titles in existence. So much so that The Phantom Pain, an almost 10-year-old game by now, still holds up to this day. And considering the modern gaming landscape's fixation on cutting-edge graphics, I'd say that's pretty You're damn pretty good. good. But while The Phantom Pain was arguably one of the best games to come out this decade, it's mostly lauded for its gameplay rather than its story, and there is a good reason for that. It's one of those rare AAA titles that, on one hand, give the player so much freedom in how to tackle every aspect of it. One of those games you can just sit back and dick around for some mindless fun, or completely immerse yourself into it, or both, and still come out with an incredibly positive experience. On the other hand, it was a very big narrative leap from the pre-established Metal Gear formula that it ended up displeasing many longtime fans who had their expectations shattered. But what if I told you that Metal Gear 5's story was better than you remember? That there are many details, big and small, that you may have missed, and that the change in the formula you knew and loved was for the better. Before we get to that though, a brief intermission. Just so we're all on the same page, and before we get to the meat of the video, allow me to explain to you the entire Metal Gear canon. Trust me, this is very important information. Okay. In 1995, CIA secret agent and Sylvester Stallone lookalike Solid Snake is sent on a solo infiltration mission to a fortress called Outer Heaven, which was reported to hold a weapon of mass destruction. While his job was to dig up information on said weapon and rescue some POWs, he ends up mowing down droves of soldiers, a manned tank actively firing at him, and a Russian gunship while completely unarmed. Until his commanding officer, Big Boss, tells him to turn off the game. When Snake realizes he lost all of his progress because the game doesn't have a save feature, he kills Big Boss with a rocket launcher, blows up his fortress, then subsequently goes into retirement. Four years later, Solid Snake was brought out of retirement by the CIA and sent on another solo infiltration mission to Zanzibar land to rescue some oil baron that was being held hostage or something. Shot down another Russian gunship, I think. Then, after some plot-related events happen, Snake finds out that the island was actually a military stronghold led by Big Boss himself, the man he killed with his own hands four years ago. Snake, being plagued by nightmares of his lost save because of Big Boss back in Metal Gear 1, kills him again with a makeshift flamethrower for the second and last time. Snake then escapes the island with his new CIA girlfriend and disappears into the Alaskan wilderness, never to be heard from again. In 2005, Snake is hunted down and captured by the CIA and is forced to go on a solo infiltration mission to Shadow Moses Island after receiving a few mystery injections in order to stop terrorist leader Liquid Snake, who held down a nuclear facility while demanding the body of Big Boss so he can clone him and create an army of super soldiers. As he progresses through the island, he ends up mowing down droves of soldiers, a man tank actively firing at him, and a Russian gunship with a tranquilizer pistol. Sounds familiar? It's because this game was just a remake of Metal Gear 1 with some plot alterations, even though they're both part of the canon. And if you've ever wondered what a snake's penis looks like, Metal Gear Solid 1 will make sure you know the answer from how much it rides one a la egregious self-insert and really funny dialogue, written by none other than Mr. Pajamas himself. You knew? Metal Gear is one of the most secret black projects. Why are you calling me brother? I'm you! What? You enjoy role-playing games. And Otaku's a guy like me who likes Japanimation. You're a strong man. It's like one of my Japanese animes. She had such a cute way of walking. She kind of wiggles her behind. I love this game. Snake also has to fight a guy called Revolver Ocelot, a Russian psychic, and a Twitch streamer before finally making it to Metal Gear. But it turns out that Snake was actually manipulated into activating the Metal Gear by Liquid Snake, who reveals that he is actually his twin brother and that both of them were clones of Big Boss himself, 
causing Snake to have a topless, bare-fisted showdown with his brother on top of the Metal Gear, after which he throws him off and watches him plummet to his death. Snake then escapes from the island with his new army buff girlfriend on a jeep. Wait. Snake is then chased by Liquid, who somehow survived the fall, only to die later to a virus that was actually in the mystery injection Snake was given at the start of the mission, which only kills people with a specific genetic code. This is actually bullshit, since both of them are clones, yet only Liquid dies for some reason. Snake then escapes the island with his new army buff girlfriend on a snowmobile, and goes into permanent retirement, never to worry about being tracked down again, as he's officially declared dead, since the CIA mistakenly identified Liquid's body for his own, as they have the same DNA. Two years later, Snake infiltrates a military tanker that carries a Metal Gear repurposed by the US Navy, then watches on as Ocelot steals it and sinks the tanker, because he was possessed by the spirit of Liquid Snake after grafting the latter's right hand on his own through surgery in France. That same Metal Gear is taken to an offshore cleanup facility where it is revealed that not only did Big Boss have a third clone, Solidus Snake, who was actually 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush, who ordered Ocelot to steal the Metal Gear from his own navy to rebel against the Patriots, a secret organization that controls the US government from the shadows. But more importantly, it was also revealed that the real Kojima self-insert was actually a guy called Dr. Emmerich, a weeaboo who ran away from home because he couldn't take his hot stepmom coming onto him anymore, but only after several years of sexual intercourse with her that drove his father to commit Minecraft Alt F4, but also has a coding genius younger half-sister that happens to have a crush on him, since the most desirable of men, irresistible enough that women will throw themselves at them disregarding the law and societal norms are of course super nerdy anime fans, as we all know. Was I talking about again? Oh. Right. George Bush is then thrown off the Federal Hall's roof, causing him to become clinically brain dead, after which it is heavily implied that the Patriots were the player controlling the game's protagonists all along. Which was later retconned to be an organization Big Boss made with his commanding officer, Major Zero, back in the 70s. You see, Big Boss was a legendary soldier who single-handedly stopped the nuclear holocaust in 1964, after being sent on a solo infiltration mission to the Russian jungle where he subsists through cannibalizing snakes, because his original codename was also Snake, but I'll keep calling him Big Boss so you guys don't get too confused. The things I do for my viewers. I got you guys back. You see, Big Boss had to rescue Russian Gundam scientist Nikolai Stepanovich Sokolov, who was actually a bargaining chip that was sold out by the US to the Soviets in order to end the Cold War, but failed his mission after being ambushed by his mentor, the boss, who defects to the Soviet Union, breaks his arm, throws him off a bridge, and gives Russia portable nukes that they used immediately to blow up a research facility right in front of Big Boss's face, who survived falling off the bridge because the boss knew he would. After this, naturally, Big Boss is taken prisoner by the CIA and is given the order to assassinate his own mentor to clear his name and stop a nuclear holocaust. Big Boss takes the deal. For some reason, even though he should be suffering from severe radiation poisoning. During the mission, Big Boss gets it on with a KGB double agent femme fatale, kills a Soviet army colonel piloting a giant nuke launching robot, all a bunch of stuff you don't care for that much really, and Big Boss eventually kills the boss with his own hands in a duel, only to learn afterward that her defection was all a ruse set up by the CIA to retrieve a microfilm that tracks back a secret hidden stash of funds hidden by a secret society called the Philosophers, which consisted of US, Soviet, and Chinese high-ranking officers, and was sentenced to be silenced by her star pupil after she finished her mission for some reason, causing Big Boss to quit the force shortly after being awarded his title by President Johnson. That same microfilm is then stolen from Big Boss by Eva, the girl he shagged in a cave, who later technically became Snake's birth mother, while he was shagging her again in a random cabin somewhere, and it turned out that she shagged Snake to steal the microfilm because she was a triple agent Chinese spy who was then exiled from China off-screen because the microfilm she stole was a fake, set up by Ocelot who is actually the boss's long-lost son who then gave the real microfilm to the CIA. Big Boss later joins up with his CIA superior, Major Zero, Eva, and Ocelot to create their own military organization, Cypher, but quits it in short order because Zero thought it was a good idea to clone the man three times without his consent, and created a separate organization of his own called Militaire Sans Frontières, or MSF, one he uses to fight a few giant AI robots made by the boss's stalker, Dr. Strangelove, builds his own personal Metal Gear, Metal Gear Zeke, with the help of both Strangelove and Dr. Hideo Emmerich's father and average NTR enjoyer, Huey Emmerich, and eventually stop another nuclear holocaust through a very cheesy phone conversation with the Pentagon, all because Big Boss was hired for no wages by a CIA agent that brought a little girl with him. I'll do it for the girl. But 
In a surprise twist, it turns out that that same girl, Paz, was actually a double agent by the name of Pacifia Ocean, sent by Cypher to modify Metal Gear Zeke and take it to zero. Which is bullshit because the technology to make a human pilot Metal Gear didn't exist at that point in time. Let alone be sophisticated enough that a 14-year-old girl could apply it in a military base without the soldiers or the two lead scientists that made the damn thing noticing. Paz then offers Big Boss a job as Cypher's non-compensated military deterrent, causing him to blow up Metal Gear Zeke with her pilot in it, after which she fell into the ocean in the middle of nowhere, presumably dead. This event also led to Big Boss's decision to create his own nation, made by, with, and for soldiers, called Outer Heaven. Now that you know the entire Metal Gear canon, I'm sure you all have that same burning question in your mind. What the f How the hell did Big Boss rejoin the CIA and lead his own unit without anyone noticing? Was there... Any intent at all in any of the games that justified the plot twists in their direct sequels, or was it all just ass pulls, as each of the games was written retroactively as a standalone experience? Metal Gear 5 attempts to answer these questions through both sides of its story, Ground Zeroes and The Phantom Pain. The keyword being attempts. As I'm sure many of you know, Konami's reward for Kojima's three-decade-old franchise was an unceremonial parting, along with the cute little move of removing his name from the credits and banning him from receiving an award for Metal Gear Solid V. Mr. Kojima had every intention of uh, being with us tonight, uh, but unfortunately he was uh, informed by a lawyer representing Konami uh, just recently that uh, he would uh, not be allowed to uh, travel to uh, tonight's awards ceremony to uh, accept um, any awards. Now I'm sure there's a more complicated inside story and there are rumors about his liberal spending that halted the game's release schedule, which is bullshit by the way. But I prefer to separate art from the artist whenever I can, to a certain extent, and the product we were left with was incomplete and impacted enough by these weird ass corporate chess moves to fully deserve a fuck you to Konami's face. However, I still do appreciate the deviation from the original writing style, which I don't think Kojima was a particularly strong proponent of, so let's talk about MGS5 now. Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes picks up directly after Peace Walker. Paz, somehow surviving both a giant robot explosion and being left for dead in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, please don't tell me that's where she got her name from, is taken captive in a facility in the coastline of Cuba. At the same time, Big Boss's organization, under accurate suspicion of holding a nuclear warhead, has to prepare for an inspection by the IAEA, one that NTR man Huey Emmerich accepted behind their backs. While this is happening, some snot-nosed brat tries to rescue Paz by himself only to get caught and imprisoned, leading up to Big Boss infiltrating the base to get both of them out. Kept you waiting, huh? But while Big Boss is dicking around in enemy territory, it turned out that the IAEA inspection was in fact a Trojan horse for Cypher's strike force, XOF, led by a man called Skullface acting independently to destroy Big Boss's mother base. It sounds like a giant info dump, but this is all set up in the first scene alone with a few choice words. I'm honestly impressed. Big Boss, succeeding in his mission, returns alongside Paz and a medic that removes a bomb surgically implanted in her stomach, only to find their base under attack by Skullface, who is a major antagonist that doesn't actually have a Skullface, and has literally zero impact outside of this game. With their base destroyed, Big Boss is forced to retreat on a helicopter until Paz jumps off of it without... Anyone interfering? For some reason? Because she had another bomb inside her. Somewhere MSF would never look. This is actually bullshit, because it's physically impossible for the medic to remove one bomb from her stomach, but fail to realize there was a second one even after stitching her up. This event culminates into Big Boss falling into a 9 year long coma, and was later called the Ground Zeroes Incident. What I find interesting about Ground Zeroes, though, is the other half of its story. Throughout several cassette tapes found during the rescue mission, it's revealed that even in her capacity as a spy working against Big Boss, Paz refused to give any information about him or MSF to Skullface, resisting both torture, two bombs shoved inside her body, and actual rape by both XOF soldiers and the snot-nosed kid playing the hero, apparently. Which, don't get me wrong, this kid has gone through some horrible shit. With that, I can empathize. But one, he brought it on himself. Two, he's probably not as much of a plot convenience as I'm gonna make him out to be, but he sure as hell feels like one. And three, 
I don't like kids. So he's shit out of luck on that front. If you were that lucky, you wouldn't even be here right now. Instead, Paz has gone as far as to even betray her former employer, Major Zero, by disclosing his location to Skullface, whose goal was to kill both him and Big Boss to take over Cypher. And yet, all of her efforts amounted to nothing because a certain genius that we're all familiar with by now told them everything they wanted to know anyway, ultimately leading to MSF's destruction and the easily preventable deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of soldiers. Do you serve any other purpose than being a plot convenience? Thankfully, he's never seen again. While comatose, Zero stealthily moves Big Boss to a hospital in Cyprus, where he eventually awakens nine years later, starring the events of the Phantom Pain. Not long after awakening, Big Boss is told he'll need plastic surgery to change his identity and permanently go undercover to hide from Cypher's ongoing threat to his life, which on a surface level, is a clever way to customize a player character while being very subtle with the foreshadowing. Most people wouldn't expect this to be reincorporated later, myself being one of those people. But it's also kind of dumb. We'll come back to this. Unfortunately, the plastic surgery never took place as Skullface's assassins, making up a literally decked out army with gunships, tanks, multiple fully armed infantry units, kill everybody in the hospital to make sure Big Boss does not leave the place alive. So, Big Boss leaves the place alive and is escorted by Ocelot all the way to Afghanistan, with the latter briefing him on the way on the events that happened during his coma. All in all, I do like this intro sequence. It's a great introduction with high stakes and high tension that establishes so many elements that get reincorporated later without beating you in the face with it, and it sets the tone for the rest of the story going forward fairly well, even if the majority of its gameplay is heavily scripted. After making it to Afghanistan, Ocelot gives the player a new moniker, Venom Snake, which I guess makes sense with the whole revenge motif going on. He's also called Punished Snake, but only sometimes? I, I guess it doesn't really matter that much, there is some symbolism there at least. Venom Snake eventually rebuilds his organization from the ground up, redubbing it Diamond Dogs, and by conducting some anti-Soviet operations in Afghanistan, ends up having several new encounters that he survives with Skullface and some super soldiers that the latter made using parasites. This is actually bullshit, because Skullface could have easily taken his life here, but chose to just walk away, which kind of contradicts his pre-established character. I do, however, think Skullface is a good villain overall. You see, Skullface wants to infect pretty much everybody with parasites that kill only English-speaking hosts and propagate through airborne transmission into new hosts' vocal cords. It's such a good concept that's utilized to its full potential, starting all the way from Skullface's backstory. He was a war orphan that was forced by enemy troops to work for them while speaking their language long enough that he ends up forgetting his own. And the torture he was subjected to, but overcame in his own, twisted way, made him obsessed with taking revenge on everyone around him. So much so that he's willing to erase English from existence. But that alone isn't enough. He wants to see the world go down in flames from a position of power, so how does he do that? Simple. Here are the schematics. Step 1. Riz up some third world countries that don't have their own nuclear technology. Sell them nukes, and quickly work your way up using that as an excuse to sell more. Step 2. Have a failsafe in your nukes so that you control all of the launch codes and none of them can be fired without your explicit consent. Step 3. Spread a pathogen worldwide using ancient voodoo magic powered parasites that will kill hosts who speak a specific language that you trained them for. Step 4. Now that the world has lost its leading common language, sit back in your condo and watch people freak out about their neighbor's nukes while intercepting digital comms with your fancy cipher tech. He's a good villain with a conceptually well thought out endgame, and his unglorified ironic death at the hands of NTR Man, possibly the most pathetic character within the MG universe, makes for a great end to his character arc that doesn't overstay his welcome. Speaking of NTR Man, he's been heavily retconned from Hideo Kojima self-insert number 2, Robot Scientist Extraordinaire, into a traitor that colluded with Skullface to allow both the IAEA inspection and XOF to take down MSF out of a misguided sense of self-preservation. I have to say I do enjoy this Huey a lot more than the Peace Walker one. He makes a big leap from a somewhat two-dimensional Hal Emmerich clone into an actual character with his own motivations. Pathetic, self-serving, and damaging to everyone around him that put their trust in him, but I like it. It's a breath of fresh air. And yet, while I do appreciate Skullface and NTR Emmerich narratively, 
the worst aspect of this game manifests itself as another character. Allow me to preface this by stating the obvious. Kojima cannot write a good character arc for the women in his franchise to save his life. Every one of them can be summed up as a conveniently attractive prop that eventually falls in love with the main character of the current title and has their entire character arc decided by the MC's actions. They exist solely to stroke the player's ego, and possibly Kojima's, by acting as a conveniently placed romantic interest with really generic character traits. It's a very transparent and obvious attempt to dick ride the player by having them self insert as the playable character, something I've seen enough times to feel nothing but disgust at whenever I encounter it again. This being no exception. That same issue rears its head in Metal Gear 5 through Quiet. On paper, Quiet is not the worst character. She starts off as the assassin sent to kill Big Boss in the intro, but all she has to show for it is severe burns all over her body and falling off the fourth floor of a hospital. She somehow survives, because of course she does, and Skullface, appreciating her tenacity and thirst for vengeance, infects her with both Super Soldier and English Killer Parasites, hoping that if she fails to kill Big Boss directly using the former, she can just seduce him and spread the latter to his base, destroying his entire organization. Again. I do appreciate that her existence serves a larger purpose as well, specifically one in service of the plot twist. And yet, everything about her in-game presence oozes this energy of just being there only for sex appeal. <laughs> I don't know if I'm just conditioned to be a jaded old fart by now or what, but I just can't see good intentions with her character design. The ending to her character arc, A Quiet Exit, is a super cheesy scene that I wish I recorded myself playing because I could not stop myself from screaming at how corny it was. So there is a little bit of that original Kojima flair in the game somewhere at least. Speaking of Kojima flair, there was an entire plot arc dedicated to Liquid Snake's Origins, who is in this game by the way, featuring a Lord of the Flies inspired setting that we'll unfortunately never get to see the resolution or full picture of. Thanks for that Konami! Alright, I delayed it long enough, let's talk about the plot twist. After going through all of this shit, fighting off some KGB spies, Muslim terrorists, shooting down a psychic controlled Metal Gear that makes creature noises for some reason, droves of super soldiers that can do this, and gunning down your own soldiers that were infected with the vocal cord parasites, it's revealed that Venom Snake wasn't Big Boss all along. What? He was actually the random ass medic that was on the chopper during Ground Zeroes and his real face was the customizable character from the intro sequence. This has been hinted at throughout the game in several occasions. For instance, Venom Snake not reacting at all to the boss's AI pod, also not blatantly telling the player that maybe he wasn't the big boss they were waiting for after all. Maybe you're not the big boss we hope for after all. And DNA test results showing that Eli, later known as Liquid Snake, not being related to Venom Snake. But what the fuck? You're telling me that just some guy is capable of conducting solo operations with the same level of skill as Big Boss, the guy known as a legendary super soldier that pretty much everyone in the world has heard of by now, all because he was, what, hypnotizing his sleep? Is he also, 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 also a clone? Truth is, I've seen a lot of people complain about the ending. Being forced to replay the intro mission with as little control as the first time, just rando over here achieving feats that no other man should have been capable of. Nobody noticing that this guy is a different person with outdated plastic surgery because, what, he was hypnotized while he was asleep? To be honest, I can see where the complaints I just listed are coming from in particular, but if you agree with them, you are objectively wrong, boy. The ending being replayed on a first time playthrough is rather well paced considering the amount of content you have to go through before getting to it and the random medic also somehow having super soldier genes and fooling himself into thinking he's big boss through hypnotherapy while in a coma is pretty dumb if you look at it in universe, especially with that attempt to throw off the player by letting them customize an avatar in the intro even though the whole point was for him to look like big boss to begin with. But it's clearly meant to be more symbolic than something to be taken literally. It's a massive love letter to the fans and everyone that supported Metal Gear throughout the years, showcasing how the series' success would have been impossible without them and sending off the franchise with the last entry in its canon. Sure, it's technically a cheap way to explain how Snake had to kill Big Boss twice in the original duology and it didn't deliver on some of the fans' expectations of seeing Big Boss's descent into villainy, which I'm not even sure where that argument came from in the first place, but the intent is undeniable. Now, I'm sure there had to be a way to deliver this intent more gracefully, but come on, people. You played through all of these, and this is what you complain about the most? 
And if that wasn't enough to convince you, this game is full of symbolism and tasteful references to its predecessors. Here's a couple instances of those. You tend to twist your elbow to absorb the recoil. You do that with a revolver. That was some fancy shooting. Pretty good. But the engraving gives you no tactical you advantage, no tactical whatsoever. advantage whatsoever. With all that being said, and though it might just be my personal taste talking, I quite enjoyed the ending for Metal Gear 5. All the symbolism, well done shots, and apparent genuine appreciation for the fans is ultimately what led me down this wild ride of tactical espionage, multi-layered, multi-faceted, multi-plot twisted journey, and it was good. Answer is B. Oh. Melissa. Oh, Melissa. You knew the correct answer was B. You should have tried just a little bit harder. Hey, Melissa? Yeah. Also, this video was just an excuse for me to play the stranding.